Welcome to the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. I am your co-host, Jay Gilbert. Uh, Michael Brandvold is off this week, so we're flying by the seat of our pants. Thank you, Michael. Um, today we have a very special guest. We have Steve Knopper. Steve is a returning guest. He's been on our show before. Um, Steve is a Rolling Stone contributing editor. Um, he wrote my favorite book on the music industry called Appetite for Self-Destruction. And we're going to talk about kind of an updated version of that book. Steve, welcome to the show today. Of course. Thanks for having me again, Jay. <laughs> so anyway, um, I got your book. Um, here's, what is this? This is the, this is like the new, I don't know if you can see this. This is the, the new kind of uh, Kindle yeah. version, which yeah, has a new, cover. a new, a new chapter in it. But before we yeah. get to that, I want to just, for those who haven't read the book, let me just move this a little bit. For those who haven't read the book, um, like I said, it, it, honestly, it's my favorite book because I Thank lived you. through a lot of those chapters, but I want, I want to just kind of go over a couple of the chapters. Um, I know you, you start off with kind of 1979 to 1982 and you talk about disco and Michael Jackson and MTV, and then you start in with what you call mistakes and, and clearly there are some mistakes that the music industry has made over the year. You talk about, you know, the long box. You talk about digital audio tape, which I think a lot of people miss. Um, just, you know, without giving a, a whole, you know, review of the book, what, what are some of those mistakes that you, you think were really kind of instrumental in uh, a, a large degree the downfall of the music industry as we used to know it and what do what do people in the music industry always come up to you and say oh i read your book this is the <laughs> part that you nailed yeah um you know it's funny I, this wasn't you're talking about those little chapters that i had in in between called big music's big mistakes yes and uh th but the one that i hear the most about is it was my position that the record business the labels should have made a deal with the original Napster when they had a chance. And I think that's the thing that everybody says. And I wasn't the first person to say that, but I was sort of the first person to kind of put it in book form, you know, and yeah. quote a bunch of industry people sort of supporting that. But it seems like, you know, when I wrote the book 2009 um, and when I was reporting the book before that, that was a very controversial position to take. Yeah. You know, it was like, we should have made a deal with Napster, you know. And, and people were like, no, we shouldn't have sold out to those, right. you know, those punk hackers, you know, and so <laughs> forth. <laughs> yeah, but and for that, the first time in our industry, yeah. we we knew what our consumers were consuming. Yeah. We never knew That's that right. before, right? So That's what right. I found really sexy and exciting about the original Napster was that you could go to them and they had data on their 40 million users yeah. or whatever it was that says, oh, well, people who like Lyle Lovett also like Metallica. We should put it right. on the road together. That sounds absurd, but we didn't know and we're just now kind of learning about who our consumers are. Did you find that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, to kind of carry forward what we were just talking about, I mean, today when I talk to record executives, and you probably have a more direct line to them than I do, but... Um, they say, well, yeah, it's it's sort of like common knowledge. It's sort of accepted. We should have made a deal with Napster when we had a chance, you know, because all this stuff that is happening today that's important for the record business, YouTube and Facebook and, and um, you know, certainly Spotify and, and iTunes and all these different things, all anticipated in the original Napster model. Yeah. So, you know, obviously a combination of all those things is, is what's leading the music business into the future, and that was all anticipated by Napster. So if anything, if they'd made a deal with Napster at the time, they would have gotten a huge head start and wouldn't yeah. have lost, probably. My, my thesis is, you know, a ton of the business that was lost during those, those crucial years. Yeah. Was, was BMG enlightened? Because I remember around the time, they seemed to want to embrace if not outright purchase Napster and wanted to kind of strike a deal, whereas some of the other majors were like, shut it down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, BMG was conflicted, as you probably remember, because the head of Bertelsmann at the time was Thomas Middelhoff. And although he's had some problems lately, uh, you know, at, at the time, um, he was sort of like the, the number one person within the record business who was championing, championing, I'm sorry, championing That's Napster, easy for you to the say. original Napster, exactly. right? <laughs> and, and so, but he was in a funny position because he was the guy that controlled the the, the high up company. You know, yeah. he was the he was the corporate overlord at the time, 
as opposed to the guy who was directly running BMG at the time, which was Strauss Zelnick. Yeah. And that guy was much more sort of in the record industry mode of Napster is going to destroy us. It's piracy. It's the enemy. You know, some of that was true. Yeah. You know, you had to fight Napster to an extent, but it, it, you had to have a sort of smart, future looking, forward thinking kind of double prong strategy with Napster. And most of the people in the industry only had really the one kind of negative shut it down strategy, as you yeah. well remember. Yeah, I see. I lived through that. You know, I, I worked yeah. for Universal for nearly 20 years and I remember those meetings. And I always take issue with folks who paint the industry as, well, they were Luddites. They did not know this was coming. Yeah, okay. Well, I worked with some very smart people, you know, the Albie Galutens of the world, you know, yep. the the Larry Kenswells, the, you know, some of these people who, these these are not stupid people. We no. saw what was coming. We We were right there. The problem is when you've got a giant ship, it's kind of hard to turn that ship. You right. know, and people are inherently afraid of what they don't understand. And Albie was... A technologist he got this stuff he understood drm before most people did and you know being in those conversations i know that each one of the majors had people there that were raising their hand at the back of the meeting going you guys we need to embrace this it's going to you know digital downloads this is the way people are consuming music in in your travels and after you wrote the book did you get people kind of you know yeah. taking issue with the fact that some people may take this as a put down of the entire industry. Um, you know, if for the uh, initial reaction to the book was sort of a lot of that. Yeah. You're, you're, you represent, you're writing about our demise. And a lot of people were very, cause I continued to cover this industry for oh, yeah. Stone after the book came out. That's right. So that made for some, some tricky interviews, you know, <laughs> and tricky <laughs> trying to set up interviews and stuff like yeah. that. But, but I did, as you remember, you know, the group of people that you're talking about, which is a large group, and you knew them more intimately than I did, but people like Aaron Yaskar and, and um, Robin Bechtel and, and um, you know, uh, Sid Schwartz, you know, um, all these people who are working at record labels from inside, and they were the ones who were kind of going to meetings wearing Napster t-shirts, and it went over as if they were punk rockers, you right. know, wearing right. the I hate pink floyd t-shirts in the 70s you know right. it, was, it was the same kind of dynamic and 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 they were going to the meetings going you guys listen to us this is the future if we're going to market more effectively using this thing called the internet and they would run into all the time you know the famous possibly apocryphal anecdote was that everybody has some vision version of the story where some old school executive said the internet is a fad you know and and they were constantly re rebelling against right that. it's a series so, yeah, of there tubes was this, really so when my book came out, I, you know, I, I tapped into that group of people a little bit and quoted yeah. them pretty extensively in the book. And when the book came out, there were other people, you know, I'll even name names, Cameo Carlson from Universal, I you know, kind of well. came up to yeah. me. She sort of sidled up to me in South by Southwest one year after the book came out and was like, I recognize that, <laughs> you know, like, and she, she became someone who, uh, who, who told me a bunch of stuff. So, sure. Um, sure. And she you know, would be the one that would, and you even put it in the book. I mean, she yeah, is and, one and of the ones that... She's yeah. quoted in the new chapter as well. So that, that made the new chapter really easy to write because I just went back to all those people who had been contacting me over the years, yeah. you know, saying, hey, for, I was part of that, too. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's a good segue. So there I do encourage everybody to read the book. Um, I do think that you paint a picture of some of these things that we won't necessarily go in today, like digital audio tape, which I think is one of the biggest things that harmed our industry, not not dat, but yeah. the the situation around it and choosing which battle to fight. I think yeah. looking back on it now, it's like, oh dear lord, you know that yeah. could have changed a lot of things, right? <laughs> yeah. But so now we're into an an area where we've anticipated this for years. We've talked about it. People have forecasted it. Now we're in an area where. It's a streaming world. Downloads yeah. are really declining. Physical sales are kind of hanging in there, dropping, you know, uh, their 10 or 12 points each year. And But with streaming growing the way it has been, um, now we're in this new music business. What are you finding, you know, when you're interviewing these people, how are people adjusting to this, this new shift? It's, it's kind of two-pronged, as I'm sure you know. You know, one is... 
the labels are delighted. <laughs> you know, I mean, you look at the numbers and the revenue numbers over the last couple of years because of streaming have just yeah. shot up. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I wouldn't say that the labels are dancing around going, happy days are here again. I mean, that's definitely an exaggeration. Not quite that. You know, certainly the, 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 ma- the massive profits of the CD era were not totally back to yet you know right. but but definitely the the trajectory is pointed upwards again and i think label people are really excited about that and they're they're going with it in a way that they were not going with it you know uh, in the in the napster era and the mp3 era where they were fighting it now they're kind of going oh how can we work with spotify to make these playlists and on and right. on but on the other hand you know the flip side of that is there's a lot of negativity and a lot of suspicion um per, especially and deservedly so rightly so from artists you know, artists are really upset about the the, um, the payout, the royalty payment statements that they're getting. I talk to managers and attorneys and business managers all the time who are saying it's getting a little better, but it's you know it's not really there. You know, and and especially when you talk about sort of like songwriters who were you know in the CD era, they were getting all this passive income, you know, just sitting at home, and the royalties were flowing in. A lot of that's not happening anymore. They those kind of people don't really have the opportunity to tour like like you know contemporary artists or, or classic artists do yeah so so i would still argue and i'm sure you know you probably concur on a lot of this um that streaming in general is good for the industry as a whole and eventually you know as it gets bigger and bigger um and and you know the label deals the artists and, the, and their reps kind of get more sophisticated about making better label deals yeah. and are able to i think that it's going to be better for everybody but right now and perhaps for a little while longer um, you know, the artists have, have a legitimate gripe. We, we certainly hear that from David Lowry and, sure. and all the things that he's talking about and all the lawsuits that he's filing. His, right. his, his complaints are legitimate and should be listened to, for sure. They, they definitely should. I do think there are some misconceptions. Now, yeah. the positive side on the streaming thing is, you know, if the average consumer was buying, say, three albums, maybe $40 a year, now we're tripling the revenue for um, the, the rights holders. But that's the key phrase, I think, is that when you read these stories online that say, oh, I've got a million streams and I only made $20, well, the the streaming services don't pay the artists. They pay the rights holders. Right. And I think right. it's incumbent upon the artists to renegotiate and have conversations with their record label, their distributor, what you know, whoever the rights holder is, so that they are being paid fairly. Um, but But I get it. I wonder, though, and, and I wonder if you've had these kind of conversations, is a stream worth a download? Is a download worth a CD? Is, I mean, is a paid stream worth the same as an ad-supported stream? I just, there's, it's much more yeah. complex now, right? I mean, please don't ask me for all those numbers because it's so complicated. You know, there's sure. point zero 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 four six pennies is what you make on one stream on most of these services, you know, or whatever. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, the answer to your question broadly is that a stream is not worth a download and a download is not worth a CD. I mean, an $18 CD versus a 99 cent download, that was a big drop in unit revenue. And then there's another big drop in, in a much oh, no. even bigger yeah. drop to streaming. And that's that's a problem and, and needs to be addressed. But it, it's sort of not acknowledging some of the other sides of this. Like, for example... Um, you know, the Beatles recently put their somewhat recently put their catalog up on Spotify. Well, the Beatles are no dummies. You know, they're they're not going to do that unless they're getting tons of cash. And sure, you know, I think the reason they were doing that is because the whole big push from downloads and CD sales from their previous reissues had sort of drifted out, and all of a yeah. sudden it was like they could just put their stuff on Spotify, and that's all free money. And not yeah. only that, but a key thing about streaming, as you well know, is is that it continues. I buy my Beatles album on CD, that's it. They get the one-time sale. That's right. But I can listen to Penny Lane, For you know, years. if I if I want to play it on a playlist or on a wedding or even better, you know, Diplo puts it on a playlist or Taylor Swift puts it on her personal playlist or yeah. whoever it is. Yeah. That song is just going to be streamed and streamed and streamed and streamed, and right. then that's money forever. I wonder how know? much and of that is because yeah. they were late to the party. Because I remember with yeah. CDs, they were late. Um, yeah. With with um, digital downloads, they were very late to the party. And oh, yeah. you know, if you looked at, you know, back then they had big champagne and and other ways that we could kind of look and see what was happening with BitTorrents and illegal file yeah. trading. 
I mean, people were stealing that stuff right and left, yeah. you know, and they weren't making any money off of it. And I think that's kind of the argument that Steve Jobs got people to go to iTunes with was, look, they're doing it now and you're not participating financially. You might as well play here. And now with streaming, I, I hear that same argument again. Yeah. Like, hey, you know, people are going to do it. They're going to listen. And you, you want to go to where the party is. And that's, yeah. that's where it is. I mean, sadly, you know, well, and, and Daniel Eck always constantly makes that argument, you know, that he's, he's really adopted that argument rather aggressively. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, Spotify it has the free side to it, and so does YouTube. And the, the argument is, well, you're not going to get anything from piracy. That's zero money coming in. But if you get this point zero 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 four six or whatever it is on the free side of Spotify or on the free part of YouTube, which is all free, you know, at least you're going to get something. And not only that, but there's a promise of more because you might upgrade to the premium service. You get more like official marketing. You can work with these services and get more stuff out of them. So that's better than nothing. And, you know, people say there's this big argument. Taylor Swift's people are constantly making, but many Irving Azoff makes it. Many others are making it, which is there should be no we should have the choice to just put our music on the premium side that people pay for. I see that argument. That does make sense. But you, I don't think that's acknowledging that people don't want, there's going to be a contingent of people out there, you know, yeah. wrongly, who don't want to pay for music at all. Yeah. And if you make everything cost something, they're just going to go back to piracy. Right. I still think that's I, real. I, and I, I do still agree think it should that. be acknowledged. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it's been proven, right? Yeah. Now, when I was reading the, the new chapter, I kind of got a different sense of who Daniel Eck is um, that I'd never really picked up on in the press. Mm. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Because it sounds, th you know, my take from it when I was reading it is that, you know, he came in to show some things he was working on, and that wasn't even his heavy hitter. And yeah, talk a little bit about Daniel Eck. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I didn't talk to him for this chapter, although I have talked to him several times over the years. Um, and, and there's kind of a mythology about him, you know, which is that he wanted to help the industry and so forth. And, and, and he was into disruption and sort of helping industries deal with disruption and kind right. of reinventing industries in response to that. And that's where his whole thing with Spotify came in. And that's all true. You know, that 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 myth is, is largely correct. Um, but, you know, I, the, the label people that that I talked to. Um, Rob Wells was one of my biggest mm -hmm. sources from, yep. from Universal. I mm -hmm. quote him extensively in there. Um, they, they were kind of talking about how, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Jay, I'm losing my train of thought here. Can you, can you repeat the question? We were talking about that, Daniel okay. Eck and, and hi, who yeah. he is and kind of the misconceptions about, you know, who he is as a, as a person and kind of the perception versus the reality. Yeah, yeah, but you were leading me in a specific well, thing that I was and, getting to. And, and just and that, you know, he had, he had brought to, I forget, if, I think Wells was in that meeting where he yeah. had brought some other application. Right, 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 right. And they right, weren't really right. impressed with it, but he, yeah. he goes, well, tell me about this other thing. Yeah, yeah. So so initially, Daniel was, um, he came from kind of the ad world and, and, and the video game kind of placement I forget the name of his previous company, but he was placing ads into video games, and that was kind of his deal. And he was meeting with Rob Wells at Universal in London to sort of see if they can make a deal on that. And and as Rob told the story, you know, Universal was sort of like not really interested in that, and they went 45 minutes on kind of like, yeah, 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 I'm just being polite here, you know. And then all of a sudden, Daniel kind of unveiled his idea for Spotify, and Rob kind of went, you know, but <laughs> wow. that's a much more interesting idea, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, and so that was, I mean, there were variations of conversations with all the labels that, that yeah. Eck had at the time. I mean, street, it's, it's, it was a re really interesting thing that Spotify did because as you well know, you know, Spotify was not the first to do music yeah. streaming and do it well. Right. I mean, Rhapsody had done oh, it, yeah. you know, and Rhapsody were... was making big business or, or they were making a significant business off it. Sure. YouTube had started already, yeah. you know, and, and so the, these were, it, it was kind of inevitable. Yeah. But Spotify sort of did what Steve Jobs did, which was kind of like take over all these disparate pieces, you know, and kind of put them together into an interface that was super easy to use, yeah. looked good. And, and then they had a couple of really interesting ideas to draw new people into this into the service, like obviously freemium, um, which came a little later. You know, that was mm -hmm. the biggest one. Yeah. But then there was this thing where they kind of like gave 
secret passwords to people. I don't know if you remember that time. No, I don't. When it was taking off, and in, in, it was just starting to take off in Europe. Oh, and I Spotify remember would, when it was first coming to the U.S., I got an yeah. early something like that. Yeah. It, it's, it happened in Europe, and then it happened later in the U.S., where they kind of, like, gave important people in the business and journalists. You know, I had one for a while, uh, you know, sort of like, here, psst, you know, here's yeah. your secret Spotify yeah. password. And, and it, it just, it turned into sort of a cachet, and it was like, are you on Spotify or you're on Spotify? It was funny, because my book came out in 2009, and the word Spotify is not mentioned in the book at all. That's funny. And, um, that is yeah, funny. and and then immediately when I started doing interviews and stuff, everybody that's all everybody wanted to talk about. Sure. And then I went to a conference, and you know Daniel Eck was there, and I was like, oh man, I missed this by like three months. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, what do you? I, I know you have to go pretty soon, but just what what do you think happened to those early ado- uh, adopting DSPs like? when Napster was quote unquote legit and Rhapsody, which I was, you know, later became Napster. But uh, when Rhapsody first came out, I mean, that was really cool. They had like a two or 3 million people way before anybody else yeah. did. What the hell happened? Yeah. I mean, I remember a buddy of mine had um, Rhapsody kind of synced with Sonos in her house. Oh, wow. Um, and, and I, you know, for the first time I, I went to her house and kind of experienced this. Um, and, and it was like, it was, it was completely revolutionary. Sure. You know, it was like, I was like, wait, why am I collecting all these CDs? You know? Yeah. <laughs> that, that was the first time I ever had that revelation. But you know, the, the early adopter thing with Rhapsody was that it's a great service and remains a really interesting and great service, but kind of was just a few years earlier than smartphones and mobile, yeah. you know, and Spotify was really the service that clicked right as all of that with was the happening. smartphone. Like, and- yeah. Just, I mean, my understanding is that Spotify came out in Europe and then a year later, the iPhone, you know, kind of allowed and enabled you to to sort of put that on the mobile service. And Got Spotify it. was adept enough to sort of say, yeah, not only can you have mobile service, but how about ten dollars ten dollars a month? You know, <laughs> yeah. Because before it was yeah. like the only the only reason to pay ten dollars a month to Spotify was to get rid of the ads. Yeah. And that's you know for for people who are annoyed by ads, and you have ten ten dollars to spend. Okay, that's something. But if you say ten dollars a month gives you the mobile Spotify, then you have like the world's most amazing transistor radio on demand, every song ever made. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. So and 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 that was the thing that was worth paying ten dollars a month for for a lot of people. I think the number is what twenty million people now. I forget. It's like a hundred million. Uh, yeah, it's overall like fifty-seven subscribers million and, are paying now. Oh, 57 are paying. Oh, okay, right. I'm sorry. Like, I'm behind like on the numbers. Close to 30 million on uh, on Apple Music. So yeah, you know, we've got a yeah, long there you way go. to go. Yeah. But holy cow, yeah. who would have thought? Yeah. You know? Well, that's the power of smartphones, too. Yes. And that was something that Rhapsody, you know, nothing that they did wrong. They just kind of came out too early. They didn't catch the wave when timing. it was coming. Yeah. Yeah. Timing. That's right. Friendster. Well, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I want to give a plug for the book again because, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I. Folks, I mean, I don't know if you can see that thing in there, but uh, it's called Appetite for Self-Destruction, The Spectacular Crash of the Record Industry in the Digital Age. Um, I, I've, I rarely read a book twice. I probably read this book four times. I just enjoy oh, thanks, going Jay. through it. It brings back memories. I've been at some of those meetings. and um, yeah. So tell people where they can find you. Um, where yeah. can they find your work, Steve? Yeah, so I'm still writing for Rolling Stone. I'm covering something today here at LA. I'm doing this from the Beverly Hilton. So, awesome. um, hello. Uh, but um, but as far as the book goes, um, you know, be sure to go on Amazon and look for the new Kindle version when yeah. you search. It's yeah. it's easy to find, but you it's got the, that blue the cover. old book is it's got the new blue and white cover that I had done on 99 Designs with a really amazing artist, and um, awesome. and so it, it's self published too. This is the first time oh, that I've actually cool. released. Yeah, yeah, I've released it sort of, you know, the the newfangled way, or at least it was, you yeah. know, ten years ago, as opposed to kind of going through a publisher and doing it the old-fashioned way. So. Awesome. Well, I hope you continue to update it, and I'll continue thanks. to um, read your work. It's fantastic, Steve. Thanks so much for joining of us. Of course. I really thanks appreciate for having it. me again, Jay. All thanks right. for the support. Yep. Talk thanks, to you later. man. Okay. Bye.